So please, can we welcome Brother Muntazir to the podium with a loud salawat, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي أحدكم الموت فيقول رب لولا أخرتني إلى أجل قريب فأصدق وأكن من الصالحين صلى على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى أنه القرآن says and spend from what we have given you in this world and spend from what we have given you before death approaches any one of you such that you will approach your Lord and say oh my Lord if only you had let me live on this earth for a little while longer so that I would have given charity and been from among the righteous ones. Uh, my name is Muntazir Jafar. Uh, I am from London, uh, and I work for the Zahra Trust. Many of you will have heard of the Zahra Trust. Um, as Brother Imran mentioned, many of you will have known Marhum Fazal. Uh, Marhum Fazal was uh, an integral part of the Trust, and I can see faces here that I've been introduced uh, to through him. Um, we primarily work in two ways. Number one is emergency aid. So many of you will have heard of the attacks on the schools in Afghanistan, the natural disasters that took place in Afghanistan as well. Um, so our team is on the ground over there providing emergency aid, as well as uh, in Yemen. I know uh, Sayyid Ammar gave, delivered a lecture on Yemen. Uh, Yemen is currently undergoing one of the worst crises, and we are on the ground over there uh, helping in the cities of Hodeida and Aden. Um, and Sana'a. The other way we work is through long-term sustainable projects. And one of, the, one of the things that Marhum Fazl taught me and that he was a very big advocate of is that helping the poor, helping the needy is not just about throwing money at them and walking away. It's about ending the cycle. And the only way to end the cycle is through education. And so the Zahra Trust works on long-term projects such as schools, uh, housing, and medical such that the people who need the help so direly, uh, it reaches them. Uh, we operate, our, our main office is based in London. We have a branch in Canada and a branch in North America as well. And one of the things about the Zara Trust is that we have our own teams on the ground in majority of the locations that we work in. We have a stall outside in the, in the foyer, I believe it's called, on the gent side and on the lady side as well. Uh, we are selling some children's activity books, uh, children's books to learn from for the holy month of Muharram. And before I end, I'd like to share with you a brief story. And this has happened to me personally. I was on the ground in one of the areas that we work in in March. Um, and I went to visit one of the houses of the beneficiaries. And to call it a house would be an injustice. It was a room inside of an abandoned hotel. And the mother was explaining to us, the mother of five children, and she was explaining to us that how difficult it is for her to sleep every single night knowing that at any point throughout the night, anybody could access the room that she sleeps in along with her children. That's not something that anybody should have to go through. They have one generator about this big that costs $200. That generator was falling apart, and it provides them with one hour of electricity a day to stay connected to the world. Right? And the worst part is that they had no hot water, and they would need hot water. And the only way they could heat water was to dip the live wires from the back of the generator into a bowl of water. Now obviously we know that wouldn't make the water entirely hot, but it would make it a little bit more usable. So these are the, the, the this is the plight of the people that the Zahra Trust are trying to help. And the reason I bring this story to your attention is that it's very easy in the UK to put money in a charity box and not really think about where it's going, to put a fiver in a box and not really think about the impact it's having on people's lives. So next time, inshallah, whichever charity, um, whichever charity you, you, is your choice to donate to, that's not a problem, but next time you put the money in the charity box or you tap your card on that machine and you hear that beep, please, please do remember that the impact you're having in these people's lives is actually tangible. 
and people really, really need that. Think about that one generator that costs $200 that would enable this family to live a much better quality of life. If everybody here was to donate five pounds, how many of those generators could we buy? How many of those families could we provide electricity for such that they could have the basic needs of their home that any of us would require? If you do have any questions about the charity, if you do have any inquiries, if you want to ask more, find out more about the areas that we work in, um, please do um, find me outside. Um, I will be there to answer any questions you may have. Um, on behalf of the, the Jamaat, firstly, I'd like to thank the Jamaat for accommodating us uh, and having us here, and we really appreciate it. Uh, and on behalf of the organizers, could I ask everybody to please uh, move as far forward as possible so not to disrupt the flow of the program? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight's program has been sponsored in the name of the marhumin whose names will be on the screen. Please do recite a surah Fatiha for all those marhumin. Al Fatiha. Please kindly welcome Dr. Sayyid Amman Akhshawani. Barakat al-Salati ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Before I begin, thank you so much, Muntada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless all of you. I'd like to first thank you all for the generosity that you showed in the appeal for Yemen, which continues until today and which has raised close to 40,000 pounds in six nights of Muharram. And inshallah, all of you online, if you haven't had the chance, try and donate. The link is there with the work with the Zahra Trust. So at least our brothers and sisters in those lands do not ever feel that we've neglected them or that we've forgotten them in any way whatsoever. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalat wassalam ala Sayyidina wa Azimina. وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد الله وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد كربلاء حفت بكرب وبلاء. The first of our loud salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. The second loud salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Who will succeed Ayatollah al-Sistani? May Allah lengthen his life is a question which has been asked by many within the Shi'i world. 
Indeed, we know that in the Shi'i world today, arguably the Marja who has the most followers, the Grand Ayatollah, his Ayatollah is Sistani. Because naturally, we find that within our communities worldwide, that Ayatollah is Sistani occupies a prominent position. As on that note, do all of our prominent Maraja. Reality is that when any member of the religion of Islam reaches the age of adolescence, there comes a point where responsibilities on the legal level begin in their lives. That moment, they imitate one of the scholars that are alive. One of the scholars who, for example, is a grand ayatollah who has completed all of his studies and published in that area and taught in that area. You therefore find that in Muslim communities and the followers of Ahlul Bayt, there is a continuous imitation of scholars from one century to another. Other schools in Islam may still refer to themselves in relation to scholars who lived over a thousand years ago. So you may find, for example, some people calling themselves Hanafi. Some might call themselves Maliki. Some might call themselves Shafi'i. Some might call themselves Hanbali. Hanafi Abu Hanifa or Malik bin Anas or Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i or Ahmed bin Hanbal were not alive 20 or 30 years ago. They were living in some cases in the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahu wa salamuhu alayhima. Allahumma salamuhu Therefore you find that while others in the schools of Islam refer to themselves by a particular mujtahid who lived a thousand years ago, we tend to refer to ourselves also by referring to Imam al-Sadiq on one side by calling ourselves Ja'fari or Ja'fariya, but also recognizing that that door of ijtihad was a door that remained open after the ghaybah of the 12th Imam. Naturally for us, when we look at the life of the Imams, the Imams for us, are those who are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imams of other schools in Islam, like Abu Hanifa, or like the Maliki or the Shafi or the Hanbali school, they do not see them as Imams chosen by God. Rather, they see them as erudite scholars. For us, the Imams are those chosen by God, and hence the discussion of Nas is there within Shi'i thought. But then, in the absence of the Imams, we refer to the scholars of the community. These scholars were scholars who came one generation after another. Some of these scholars were based in, for example, the land of Najaf, Baghdad, Hilla, Kufa, Medina, Mecca, Qom, and other parts of the world. You therefore find that one century after another, this continuation of ilm has always been there. It's as if even if you ask your parents who are sitting in the crowd or watching online, They'll say to you they may have lived in the time of five maraja. There are some who are sitting in this hall who remember the days of Ayatollah Muhsin al-Hakim. May Allah bless his soul. Others may remember the days of Ayatollah al-Khoi. May Allah bless his soul. Others may remember the days of Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. May Allah bless his soul. Others may remember the days of Ayatollah al-Gulpaigani. May Allah bless his soul. Others may remember the days of Ayatullah al-Khumayni, may Allah bless his soul. All of these maraja left an unbelievable legacy, be it in law mainly, but also some of them left a legacy in Quran, some left a legacy in theology. But arguably, one man whose legacy, and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although the lecture discusses who his successor is, that his life continues to be a long one, one man who continues with a legacy that is unbelievable is Ayatollah al-Sistani. Ayatollah al-Sistani's legacy has very much been part of our lives here. As in, you can look at literally everybody who's sitting here right now, and you'll see that in one way or the other, they have an understanding or relationship to Ayatollah al-Sistani, to the extent that the Pope wanted to meet Ayatollah al-Sistani. Imagine, in the eyes of some, they may say, well, what difference does it make to us if the Pope wants to meet? But on a world stage, the Pope is followed by half of the world. So when the Pope is followed by half of this world, or let's say, in some cases, one third of this world, the reality is 
that we also have to recognize his important position. The Pope meeting Ayatollah Sistani highlighted just the enormous level of extent of legacy that Ayatollah Sistani had left behind, both nationally and internationally. As in, I'm sure you'll all agree that Ayatollah Sistani was the one who was able to quell the se sensitive sectarian issues that could have erupted in Iraq, for example. And many of his statements were made in the context of the people of Iraq, recognizing that there could have been a Sunni and Shia bloodbath that took place. Likewise, at the same time, he survived persecution. He survived the period of Saddam's rule. Likewise, at the same time, he was the teacher of many of the students of knowledge who are there today. When Ayatollah Sistani passes away, who then succeeds him and becomes the dean, one may argue, not only of Najaf, but one may argue of the whole Shi'i world. Because many people wonder that when that day comes, is it a transmission or a successorship that is smooth? Is it one that is going to be rocky? Is there going to be someone like Ayatollah Sistani with his leadership skills? Who's going to decide? How do they decide? Because when you look, for example, at what one might say is the equivalent in Catholicism, the Pope, the Pope, there may be a group of people who may decide who the next Pope is. How does it work in the case of Ayatollah Sistani? If now I'm a muqallid of Ayatollah Sistani, how do I know who the next successor will be? Who are the possible candidates? Because there are some who might still be alive, who others might follow. So now, for example, you have Maraja alive like Ayatollah Khamenei is alive. You have, for example, Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasan is alive. You have, for example, in Najaf, Ayatollah Bashir al-Najafi, Ayatollah Ishaq al-Fayyad, Ayatollah Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim just passed away recently. But there are others in Najaf as well who are alive, such as Ayatollah Sanad is alive of those Maraj who is there. So someone might go towards that direction. But the ultimate question is, who are the main candidates to succeed him? Are there candidates who will be able to lead Shiism into a new era? Yes, Ayatollah Sistani might end up living longer than some of the people I'll mention tonight. But also at the same time, mentioning who the candidates are tonight highlights to us that in a way there is a protection continuously for the scholars who protect the heritage of the Imams. Because the reality is that some of the names we might mention tonight are names that you may have heard of. Other names are names you may not have heard of. But the legacy that they have already, be they in their 50s, in their 60s, in their 70s, is already a strong one. Let us tonight examine who could be the successor to Ayatollah Sistani. And I'd like to do this in a few stages. Number one, how important is it that Najaf is honored and that Najaf remains a symbol for Shi'i thought? And how did Najaf reach such prominence in it being the center of Shi'i religious learning? Number two, how important was the successorship of previous scholars Number three, who would I like to see as the successor of Ayatollah Sistani? And number four, who are the ten candidates that can be possibly chosen from, from those who are alive? And number five, what do those all share in common with one another in relation to their lives? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Ayatollah Sistani today is known as the Dean of the Seminary of Najaf or the Rector of the Seminary of Najaf. Najaf without a doubt for us is Ivy League. In the same way in America someone might say Harvard and Princeton are Ivy League or in this country someone might say Oxford and Cambridge. We have of course Najaf and Qum producing some of the greatest ulama that we've ever seen. But where did Najaf gain that prominence from? In reality, Najaf, before Islam, already was quite prominent because there was already people of the Abrahamic faiths who had settled in Najaf. Why would they settle in Najaf? Those of you who've done ziyara of Najaf will know that there are prophets who are buried in Najaf. Don't you agree with me? There are prophets who are buried where? In Najaf. Where? Some say in Wadi Salam. Not just Wadi Salam. 
But there are prophets who are neighbors of Imam Ali alayhi salam. If I was to ask you who are the prophets buried next to Imam Ali alayhi salam, it would highlight to you that Najaf is not just a place that was a center for Shiism. It was a center of Tawheed, center of monotheism. On one side of Imam Ali alayhi salam is Nabi Adam alayhi salam. And on the other side of Imam Ali alayhi salam is who? Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. Now that's pretty good neighbors to have because when you die, you want the two to be buried next to you to be good people. So here you have with Nabi Adam alayhi salam, on the one side, Nabi Imam Ali, Nabi Adam and Nabi Nuh. Some say, some say that the word Najaf comes from Najaf, the water of the Nay in the time of Nabi Nuh, as you know, the flood went into that particular area. That area, when it became dry in Arabic, something which is dry is called Jaff. And if the water area was known as Nay, so when the water dried after the flood of Noah, some say that that could be the meaning of putting the two words together. Nay, Jaff. Na, Jeff. Others say, no, it's the hill on the upper reaches of Najaf. Irrespective, that area, therefore, was an area a few miles away from Kufa, was an area where Christians used to live. People used to gather there from the Christian community. They used to celebrate the praises of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they say that Nabi Hud and Nabi Salih are buried where? Buried in Wadi Salam. And some say that Imam Ali alayhi salam wished to be buried in Najaf so that he could be next to his brethren Hud and Salih. But the reality of Najaf is prominence all centers on Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. That there is no doubt. That if you want to see why Najaf is Najaf, literally it's for Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali, when he moved from Medina, came towards the land of Kufa, moved his government spiritually, maybe to be near prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are there. But of course politically, to counter Muawiyah and the rise of Muawiyah and the land of Sham, Imam Ali alayhi salam lived in that area. But someone asks if his house is in Kufa, then how is it that Imam Ali is buried in Najaf? Because you got to travel. How long from Kufa to Najaf? Let's say, for example, a number of kilometers to get there. Many of us who've done the ziyara will know that from our hotel in Najaf until we get to Kufa, it's like sometimes a 20-minute bus ride. Imam Ali alayhi salam died in his house in Kufa next to Masjid al-Kufa. Then he's buried in Najaf. How was he buried in Najaf? Imam himself had made it clear to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam and to his sons that when you carry my janazah, you will carry one part and there will be unseen forces that will carry the other. Imagine that I carry one side of the janazah and the other side is the malaika who are carrying it. And they took it and he said to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, you will see a grave and there will be a mark there that this has been prepared for Ali ibn Abi Talib by who? By Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. Nabi Nuh had prepared the grave of Mawla in that particular area. But that grave, like his wife's grave, started off with nobody knowing where it is. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam's grave until today, do any of us know where it is? None of us know where it is. It was always going to be a symbol that if you ever doubted what happened to me, just go and ask where my grave is. If it was as smooth as it looked, my grave shouldn't be hidden. Anyway, Fatima Zahra, her grave, nobody knows. Imam Ali, 92 years, nobody knew where he was buried. 92 years. Only the Imams would know. Nobody else. One day, Abu Hamza Thamali, you know Abu Hamza, the one with the long, long, long dua in Shah Ramadan. Abu Hamza Thamali says, I was with Imam Zain al Abidin, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And he says that he said to me, come with me. He said, where are we going? He said, just stand here and recite after me. And he started to recite the ziyara of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Abu Hamza asked, why are we reciting it here? He said, this is the spot where my grandfather is buried. But it wasn't until the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that this became open. Some tried to say that Harun al-Rashid or one of the Abbasid Khalifas was playing with his dogs and his dog came near the grave 
but stopped. And they found out that's the grave of Imam Ali. That's a load of nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Reality is that the Imams themselves knew where the grave was. But they waited until a time that was suitable. Because of Najaf's prominence, having Imam Ali السلام, people were always attracted to Najaf. And therefore, in the absence of the 12th Imam and in the Ghaiba, you found that ulama were attracted to go on ziyarah of Amir al muminin until one alim became the main man who ensured Najaf was established. And that was Sheikh al Tusi. Sheikh al Tusi used to live in Baghdad until the Seljuks. And the sectarian hatred that was present in Baghdad. Don't forget that as a Shi'i, when someone tells you don't be sectarian, don't forget that we faced years of bitter sectarianism towards us. Dogs and Rawafid and God knows what other titles we've been called. We've also faced sectarianism. Sheikh al tusi had a great library in Baghdad. That library was burnt. They burned the library. They burned the library of Sheikh al tusi but it was a blessing in disguise. Because Sheikh Al-Tusi moved from Baghdad to Najaf. Around which year? About a hundred odd years after the 12th Imam went into his Ghaibah. Around 446 after Hijrah. So we're coming very close to a big celebration in terms of Najaf's history. From there, therefore, Sheikh Al-Tusi established Najaf as the central location. That you are now a neighbor of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You are now a neighbor of the most spiritual place because ultimately when I want to go and study, I can study legal texts and theological texts in the UK. I can study law and theology and ethics in America or in Canada or in Australia. But being in a place where an imam of Ahlul Bayt sallallahu alayhi wa or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is buried, it is the biggest honor. Wallah, sometimes I wish that we were able, for example, to be in Medina al Munawwara studying over there. Next to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Next to Fatwa al Zahra, next to the Imams of Jannah al Baqiyah. But it's sad that we cannot teach Shi'ism in that particular area. So, where were we teaching? Shaykh al Tusi began the teaching in the land of Najaf. And ulama, even if they were studying somewhere else, would still take a few days off to go to Najaf, do some research and come back. Allam al-Hilli being an example, even if he lived in Hilla, he would still come to Najaf for a few days and then go back. Of course, Najaf wasn't always prominent. Of course, Qom had its time, Hilla had its time, Baghdad had its time, other areas had their time. But ultimately, you find that many years later, Najaf remained that core where everybody wanted to come and study. Someone says, question, the likes of Ayatollah Sistani, for them to reach that position of Ayatollah, how do they reach it exactly? So say I signed up to study in Najaf tomorrow. What do I begin with? If you were to sign up now to, let's say, Loughborough University, and you wanted to study law at Loughborough, how many stages would it be for you to learn? You do a bachelor or LLB, let's say, for example, and then you might do a master's in law. And then you're going to do a PhD. Yes? You're going to do these three stages. When you finish your PhD, you reach a level where you are similar, for example, to other doctors in the field. But then you might lecture and lecture and lecture until you become a professor. No one finishes a PhD and automatically becomes a professor. Rarely does that happen unless they may have written 20, 30 journal articles, let's say, while they were doing their PhD. Likewise, Najaf was the same. Ayatollah al-Sistani, when he goes towards Najaf, Ayatollah al khui Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Ayatollah al Khomeini, all, even Ayatollah Khomeini, with all his studies in Qom, he wanted one day to be able to be in Najaf, which he eventually was because of exile. They all start off by doing a bachelor's. The bachelor's begins with what? They call it the Muqaddamat. Yes, the Muqaddamat is like you doing a BA or a BSc. You start off by doing Arabic grammar fundamentally. And something missing in Shi'i communities worldwide is being strong in Arabic. That's something we need to work on now. Nahu, Sarf, Balagha, these are areas which in English, all of you know, rhetoric, syntax, morphology, 
we are not as strong in Arabic as other schools in Islam. In Arabic, you'll find that many of our kids grow up without learning Arabic. If a person from a young age establishes Arabic in their children, believe you me, they can become the greatest scholars for Islam, be it literally or representatives for Islam, metaphorically. Fundamentally, when they start in Najaf, Ayatollah, Sistani and others, young age, they will start, for example, by studying Arabic grammar. There's a number of famous texts which we share with the non-Shi'i community. Sunnis and Shia, when it comes to Arabic grammar, both agree that one of the prime texts that has to be studied, or one of the prime subjects that has to be studied, be it Najaf, be it Al-Azhar, be it Medina, is that you have to start off by mastering the language of the Qur'an. Today, we have a generation in some cases who don't read Dua in Arabic, but they read Dua in English. Why? Because they say that I understand it better. They have a point, yes. Or some days, read it in English so you understand what you're reading. But it's a shame that at your age, you are not able to learn Arabic and master Arabic. Why is it that we, the Shia, in the 2022, are amongst the weakest when it comes to Arabic grammar, when there are so many courses online for us to learn syntax and morphology? The Quran becomes a different book when you look at the secrets of the Arabic language. A word that looks like the most basic word suddenly becomes a monumental word in the way it changes you as a human being. But the onus, by the way, is on the leaders of the community to push Arabic grammar. So, Sunni and Shia, Najaf or Al-Azhar or Medina will begin. Al-Ajur for example, they'll study texts such as Sharh ibn Aqil, they'll study Qatr al -Nada. These are the main Arabic texts that people will study. The likes of Siba Way, ibn Aqil, and others who are masters of the Arabic language will begin with studying that. And then at the same time, study logic. Someone says, wait, in Hausa they study logic. I thought you were going to study Quran and Hadith. No. Of the main subjects is mantiq, logic. Because ultimately we need to make sure that the way we think, there are rules for what's right, what's wrong, what's common sense, what are analogies and so on. And so people will study mantiq. So Ayatollah Sistan, you see, Arabic grammar, mantiq, people will study a text like mantiq, al-mudaffar. Then others will do hadith studies, introduction to hadith. At the end of the day, I want to protect the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu so I need to study the world of hadith. Then I might open a risala amaliya, or a treatise of fiqh of a previous marja. So some people, if I'm living now, I might open the risala of Ayatollah al-Sistani or of Ayatollah. This is all where? Bachelors. We haven't even gone on to masters. Masters then goes on to certain assigned texts from either the medieval period or recent. So I might study a text in my masters from a great alim like Shahid al-Awwal or like Shahid al-Thani or like Alam al-Halli or like Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. But people will say, Baba, these ulama are from a few hundred years ago. That's why people like Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, may Allah bless his soul, were of the ulama who began to write texts that were a bit more user-friendly for the master's degree. Yes? So Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, amongst his texts, he wrote them much more user-friendly. After doing my master's, what do I do after that? I then move on to PhD. Master's, what did we say it's called? Muqaddamat, introductory. Ma sorry, bachelor's, muqaddamat. Master's, sutuh. The PhD, kharaj al-fiqh, or bahith kharaj which means you go even further than the assigned literature, you begin to discuss and debate with the marja who's teaching you, for example, or with the mujtahid who's teaching you. So if you look in the cases of, for example, the scholars that are alive today, some of them were students of Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, some were students of Ayatollah al khui they would have sat, you see how I'm sitting here? They would sit under them. These teachers would talk discuss chapter of fasting, chapter of hajj, because what are the maraja? They are jurists who have reached the highest level of ijtihad, where they are able to extrapolate the laws from the sources. So you sit there, if you've reached PhD, now someone says, can I attend, for example, this PhD class of marja X? Anyone can attend, but you might look a bit baffled if you haven't done your bachelor's and master's. Imagine now, 
I go to a particular course at Loughborough University and it's a course in economics, PhD level. Can I attend? I don't think the uni professor is going to look at me and say to me, you can't be here. But he's going to be like, what are you doing in a PhD class on economics when you've not done a bachelor's? But anyone can attend. There's a particular Socratic way of learning where you can discuss, the teacher is open with you, and that has produced some of the greatest scholars. But also has produced people who are muballighin, people who are resident alims, and so on and so forth. When you finish, how do you become ayatollah? Your teacher or the marja, he will assign you with a license when he believes you are competent enough to be able to derive law from the sources. If he sees that you have, for example, an expertise in understanding jurisprudence and the principles of jurisprudence, and you have, of course, they all give different criteria as to what are the attributes of a marja, but on the one hand, the criteria that your Arabic is top, that your ability to understand the legal text is top, will put alongside that that your taqwa and God consciousness is top as well. A person may be a genius in Islamic law, but maybe someone whose character is questionable. Or someone who not, may not be respected by his peers for his morals. The idea is that that person who reaches that level, that person has to be somebody who has reached a level where their taqwa and their intellect is equal. Not just that a person's intellect is enough. Ultimately, that person, all of us face a struggle in life to reach a certain level. But if you look at the likes of Ayatollah Sistani, for example, Ayatollah Sistani ultimately has lived a life, at least publicly, has lived a life where one could say that it's as close to being ma'soom as possible. Now someone says, what do you mean? Why do I say that? I don't think anyone could put a black dot on his character. Yes, humans, if they want to find a black dot, humans can put anything out of context. If today I said God is God, people can take that out of context. True? Humans can take anything out of context. But you look at Ayatollah Sistani, and truly all these years, in the middle of all the upheavals, all the troubles, all the difficulties, you find that he still is somebody who has impeccability. I ask the question, if someone like him can reach a level in their life where you find it hard to find a black dot on them, Allah couldn't create 14 who lived their whole lives without a black dot on them? Today when a person says, are you sure that imams are ma'soom? Buddy, I've got an example of someone who's lived at least 75-80% good. Allah couldn't create 14 ma'soomin who could be impeccable? Is it that hard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You find, therefore, that when he reaches this position, he reaches this position. Someone says, how is he assigned? Because he has teachers like Ayatollah al-Khu'i, Ayatollah al-Naini, others of the Ayatollahs who may have seen him. And that's ultimately how a person reaches that position. Your teachers either look at you and say that you're sharp enough to be able to do this. Or, oh, wallah, there are some people who become mujtahids at 65. Ayatollah al-Sistani became mujtahid at which age? 31. 31. Some 65. Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, I think, even much younger than Ayatollah Sistani. You're looking at possibly even teens or early 20s. You look at some people's abilities differ. Some have this word, Qudra. They have this ability or potential, at the very least, to be able to do istimbat and extrapolate the laws very young. There are others, it takes time. Ultimately, it's tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallah, when I look at the successorship of our maraja, at least in the last hundred years or so, I say a lot of it is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe you me. When Ayatollah Muhsin al-Hakim was passing away, people were wondering who's going to come? Is there any scholar? What's going to happen? Ayatollah Muhsin al-Hakim, how great he was. Who succeeded him? In the eyes of many, Ayatollah al khoi Yes? And at the same time you had Ayatollah al-Khumaini was present. And there were others who were present like the, the likes of, for example, Ayatollah Shari al When Ayatollah al khui passed away, you see even members of the Khaja community were wondering that who will succeed Ayatollah al khui At the time, Marhum Mullah Asghar, may Allah bless his soul, was in a position where he had enough connections to be able to 
tell the community that this is the direction that we want to head. Some communities may not be privy to that guidance. Uh, ultimately, you as a Shi'i can choose who you want to follow. But when you look at what's happened with Ayatollah al-Khu'i, some people were wondering what's going to happen, what's going to take place. I guarantee you many people did not know who Ayatollah Sistani was. Do you agree? Many people who at the time when Ayatollah al-Khu'i was passing away, many didn't know who Ayatollah Sistani was. Today, if I ask you, Someone might say to me, but who's going to succeed Ayatollah Sistani? He's got such an amazing legacy. The names that I'm going to mention to you, I guarantee that many may not have heard of them. But that doesn't mean there isn't a conveyor belt of ulama who are ready, but the ultimate tawfiq comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Ayatollah al-Khu'i passed away for a short period, members of the community followed Ayatollah al-Gulpaigani. Sometimes people may have imagined Ayatollah al-Gulpaigani was going to live for another 20 years, passed away within months. Ayatollah al-Araki was there. It passed away until it came to Ayatollah al-Sistani. Did Ayatollah al-Sistani go looking for it? This is interesting. No one see Ayatollah al-Sistani when he became marja in the sense of people following him in the early 90s. Not looking for it. But he had an ijazah, a license, an approval that was there. And he became marja in that period from around 92 onwards or 94 onwards. When we therefore look then after Ayatollah Sistani, and again I stress, may Allah lengthen his life, because we don't want to make it sound in a way, but people plan for afterwards. If you were to ask me who I would want to succeed Ayatollah Sistani, I will tell you who I want. You allow me to tell you? I believe, and I'm certain, that the best person, and I think you won't disagree with me, to succeed Ayatollah al-Sistani, not just to succeed, but in reality, even Ayatollah al-Sistani will say this, is that I believe it is, inshallah, the 12th Imam's reappearance. Why do I say this? Because sometimes we get so drawn up in successorship stories. Instead, maybe we pray that our 12th Imam comes to lead even during the life of Ayatollah al-Sistani. Because if our 12th Imam reappears, Ayatollah Sistan will be the first to be saying, there you go, O son of Fatima. Isn't that true? Ultimately for me, the first dua that I would want to do is, Allahumma ajil faraj waliya amrik al qa'im. Yes, I would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the one who hastens the reappearance of the 12th. This should be our dua first and foremost. That before you name the fallible, first think of the infallible. How many of us recite always, Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of our Imam. Ya Allah, allow us. You've all seen Dua Al-Ahad and you've seen Dua Al-Faraj and you've seen other Ad'iya which talk of hastening, hastening, wishing we can be there to see the reappearance. For me, ultimately, like Ayatollah Sistani, I pray that Allah allows us to see the reappearance of the 12th Imam. That's on the one level. If not, then who are the candidates? There are 10 who are seen as the main candidates. Three of them, I could say we could put them in Champions League positions in reality. But then I'll leave the rest for you to decide. There are three who are in the Champions League positions. And there are seven who themselves, in all honesty, are Champions League quality but for one reason or another may not be at the same level as the top three. The one who many speak about as the successor to Ayatollah Sistani in Najaf, the first one, and possibly in pole position, is, is Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani. Some say Ayatollah Baqir al-Irawani, yes? He was born in 1949. Some people here, I don't know how many of you have heard his name. Some might turn around and say, I've never heard his name. But Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani was born in 1949, which makes him today approximately how old? 73 years of age. He already comes from a scholarly family, just to add that he's my relative, but still I'll praise him a bit more. He already comes from a scholarly family in that his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather, they are all scholars of the highest repute, one after the other. And you found that he was born in Najaf, studied in Najaf, and taught in Najaf. Studied in Qum, and taught in Qum. But he has a particular dimension to him. The first of them, 
If you ask any Mawlana who has studied in Najaf and Qum, you say to them, do you know Sheikh Baqir al-Rawani? Straight away their eyes will pop up. Why? Because there's no way that you could have come towards the level of Ijtihad unless you would have studied one of his books. Either his books on Fiqh, Usul al-Fiqh, or his books on Rijal and the narrators of Ahadith and the world of Hadith, or even introductions to works of theology and tafsir of the Quran. Ask any Mawlana, you know. Just say to him, Mawlana, have you heard of Sheikh Baqir al irawan Straight away, Sheikh Baqir, of course. Fiqh al-Istidlali, one of his main works, which every Mawlana, one way or the other, would have studied. Number two, on the point of his books, he wrote his books in a way so that the medieval texts, which were a bit too difficult in the way they were studied, he wrote his books in a way which will be more user-friendly for the reader. Yes. His books, by the way, a few of them are available in English, translated by ICAS Press. Introduction to Hadith, Introduction to Fiqh. Introdu very academic, but soft style, easy to read, easy to understand. In the past, some of these students would have to study books from like five, six, seven hundred years ago. You know, some of them are studying, for example, Al-Lum'a al-Dimashqiyya or Rawd al-Bahiyya. These are books which can be very difficult to study in terms of Islamic law, you found that Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, who happened to be the teacher of Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani, he, his halaqat came as a reform, and Sheikh Baqir's works on fiqh came as a reform to what may have come before in things being easier to study in the world of hadith, rijal, and fiqh. Number one, number two, number three, is that he's a people's person, Sheikh Baqir. What does people's person mean? He gives lectures, he gives majalis. He is a person who when he's talking will say the odd humorous comment as he talks. He speaks in a very, in a language which is easy for the street to relate to. Of course, that doesn't mean that someone who doesn't do that, it's a negative on them. Everyone has their own character. But Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani, when he moved from Najaf towards the land of Qum, you found that the man himself, when he was, went towards that land, mixed with the people, sat with the people, laughed with the people, ate with the people. Not known at all for being someone too difficult to talk to. No, easy to talk to. Easy to approach. Student of Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir Sadr, Ayatollah al khoi and Ayatollah Al-Sistani. He's their student. And his lectures, you type his name on YouTube, although his lectures are mainly in Arabic, but you'll see all his lectures are available online, not just on fiqh. Even lectures on Imam al-Hussein lectures on akhlaq. He is seen by many because he is teaching a class, as we said, the PhD class. You have to teach that class for you to possibly be a successor to Ayatollah al-Sistan. You can't just be someone who has knowledge. He teaches kharaj al-fiqh. And therefore, in the eyes of some, he is the number one candidate to succeed Ayatollah al-Sistani. He is revered by the office of Sayyid al-Sistani. They revere him, they respect him. Every student of Qum and Najaf respects Ayatollah al-Irawani, who we call Sheikh Baqir or Ayatollah, even though on his books he always signs off Baqir al-Irawani. He doesn't put Sheikh, he doesn't put Ayatollah, he doesn't put Hujjat al-Islam, out of respect for his teacher who's still alive. So he will only sign off Baqir al-Irawani. And that's it. In respect of the fact that Ayatollah al-Sistani is still alive, he will not write that. But of course, he himself is a mujtahid and is number one in pole position. That's number one. Someone says, who's number two? Number two is Sayyid Muhammad Rada al-Sistani, son of Ayatollah al-Sistani. He at the moment, many of you who visit Ayatollah al-Sistani's office will see him standing at the door. But many times people only see him in an administrative role. They see him, salam, welcome, leave, welcome, salam, come. That's what they see him, but they don't realize that the man himself is an erudite scholar and a student of Ayatollah al-Khoi, student of his father as well, a man who is teach and taught the highest level of Islamic jurisprudence, expert, especially on the chapter of Hajj. So he is seen as candidate number two. Someone says, why? Because he's already run an office of marja'iyah. 
And therefore, the infrastructure plays a major role. There's no doubt about that. Someone who has the experience of seeing his father, the way his father interacts, the way his father talks, the way his father runs, for example, an office, he is seen as candidate number two. Candidate number three, a name which many may not have heard of, Sheikh Hadi al Rabi, One of the great scholars who is alive today in the land of Najaf and a scholar who is seen by his peers as definitely somebody who has a chance to be at that position of being a marja. Okay, so that's another of the scholars, student of Ayatollah who Muhammad Baqir al sadr and student of Ayatollah al khoi So you see the connection that exists. All of these first three, who are they always? Student of Sadr, student of Khoi, student of Sistani, because there's a continuation. You're my students, and that's normal. Even if I graduated from university, it's very normal for me to be a student of that professor. If you look at in the professors in the world today, there are many who have studied under Professor X. He has taught and graduated. So now you have these three. These three are the prime candidates to be successors to who? To Ayatollah Sistani. Then after that, there's another seven. Those seven may be in Europa spots. Or they may be getting close to the Champions League. Or with Tawfiq, ultimately, they could easily turn out to be the successor. We don't know. Of them you have Sheikh Hassan al-Jawahiri. Okay. Of them you have Sayyid Ali Sabzawari, whose father, of course, was Ayatollah Sabzawari, grand scholar. Of them you have, of the Hakim family, there are a number of people. As you know, the Hakim family produced many and continues to produce many grand scholars. You have Sayyid Hussein al-Hakim, who was a student of the great Sahib al-Hakim, the great scholar. You have, for example, Sayyid Muhammad Jafar al-Hakim, who no longer teaches Kharaj al-Fiqh, but was one of the top students of Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim, may Allah bless his soul, who passed away recently. You have Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Hakim, you have Sayyid Hussain, Sayyid Ja'far, Sayyid Muhammad ja All of these four Hakims, all of them have a chance to be marja. Another one, and the final one, who has a chance to also be a successor to Ayatollah Sistani, is who? The final one is his other son. Many times... People meet Sayyid Muhammad Rada Sistani, son of Ayatollah Sistani, but don't meet Sayyid Muhammad Baqir Sistani. Sayyid Muhammad Baqir Sistani, Mujtahid. Sayyid Muhammad Rada Sistani, Mujtahid. At the end of the day, they're brought up in an environment from a young age, straight away. You know, people go and study Naho and Sarf, Arabic grammar from like 15, 16, 21. These from a young age already, straight in. Arabic grammar, Hadith, Fiqh, Logic, Mantiq, straight in from a young age. He is another candidate to be successor. You look at all of them, therefore, and someone asks, is Shiism in a healthy position? I think it is in a healthy position. Because with all of these, they have their different characters, their different personalities. Some of them are not just focusing on law. Some of them have gone towards a world of theology because we live in a world where there is now a new theology, a theology that with the rise of science and philosophy and modernity, we need to be able to address new issues. So some of them have gone to a world of theology. Because sometimes people say to me, our maraja, they don't know what we're living. Don't you hear this? Sometimes you hear people saying, our maraja don't know what we're going through. They don't know what we're living. They don't know what we're seeing. Some of these personalities have made an effort to travel outside of Najaf as well. To go to America, to go to Britain, to go to Lebanon, to be able to see the muqallideen. Let me see what your issues are what your difficulties are, what your problems are. Not all of them are only residing in Najaf. I know, for example, Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani has come to London. And albeit he may have come, let's say, for family surgery or whatever, he has come to London. Others of them who I mentioned have come to London. Others of them have gone to Europe. Others of them have gone to Beirut and Lebanon. There is a need for those maraja. There is a need for them to also meet the muqallideen and to see some of the real life issues that we face. So some of them have political theories discussion. Philosophy, by the way, philosophy, you know, philosophy is always a controversial area in Shiism. There are some philosophers who people ended up calling mushrik. And there are others who praised philosophy, yes. Some people look towards 
the greats in philosophy and some people have doubts over them. You see people dispute over the likes of Allama Tabatabai and his legacy. But in Najaf, some say Najaf has no place for philosophy. No. Even amongst the teachers of Najaf, you might get one of the teachers of the Hakim family saying, no way. And another of them saying, no, no, let's study philosophy. Let's open modern, contemporary philosophy and try and readdress. There are some of them who've even gone back and said that instead of just following on fiqh and rulings, let's even look at imama again and explain imama and elaborate on imama. So they go towards usul al-deen and not just furu' al-deen. Najaf, therefore, is in a healthy position. With these ulama that are there, all of them are ensuring that a legacy continues. Who decides who's going to be next? Is it like the Vatican where we all get in a room and we're like, let's give it to so-and-so? Not really, to tell you the truth. It doesn't really work like that. Everybody pretty much knows who should be in the ascendancy. But that doesn't stop others from also reaching a level. But as for the rector or the dean of the seminary, everybody pretty much knows beforehand that we're trying to push towards this direction. This person's the best of the teachers. He is someone who's favored by the current marja. But without the marja himself saying, this is my successor. It's not a ghadir khum situation of saying that this person is the successor. No, not at all. It becomes a situation, I think, ultimately of tawfiq in that moment, to tell you the truth. You tell Ayatollah Sistani when Ayatollah Khu'i dies, he led the janazah of Ayatollah Al-Khu'i and was not announced straight away as marja. If you lead the janazah of Ayatollah Al-Khu'i, you would think you'd straight away be Najaf's marja. But no, at the time Ayatollah Al-Gulpai Ghani may be in senior, Araki may be senior. So ultimately, it comes down to tawfiq. And that we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on nights like this to lengthen the life of all of our ulama, ya Allah. And allow them to continue in their service of Al Muhammad. Yes, sometimes, my dear brothers and sisters, you may hear that this alim should do this, that alim should say this. At the end of the day, our ulama try their hardest to try and be God conscious, to try and allow us to emulate them in the best way that they can to try and reach us. But ultimately, there are only 14 who are ma'soom in this world. Apart from the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for a person to turn around and see an alim say something or do something, turn around straight away and want to stab and attack. No, a person should turn around and ask those who are experts in the field. You could have one issue, one issue, which one alim says is haram, another says is mustahab, and another says I don't give an opinion on. Is there one who is 100% right in Shi'ism? Only one alim who's on? No, otherwise he should be the 15th ma'asum. Everybody has their ijtihad. And ultimately, we look towards their worldview. But one thing they certainly all agree on is what? Is they all agree that they want to be near the shrines of Al Muhammad. That's something you'll see in all of them. You sit with them and they'll say to you that when they were in Qum, they lived being next to Sayyidah Ma'soom alayhi salam. Yes. How many of us yearn to do ziyarah of Sayyidah Ma'soom alayhi salam? Then when they were in Najaf, Ayatollah al-Khumayni used to love Najaf because he could walk to the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. There was a period in Najaf where you could go to Salat al-Jama'ah of Ayatollah al-Khumayni and Ayatollah al khu Imagine that feeling that in Najaf you could have gone and for them, they'll say to you, you pray behind us, maybe your best feeling, but us going to the shrine and being next to Al Muhammad, that's our best feeling. And among something they all have also is that they've all, in one way or the other, written poetry in honor of Sayyid al Shuhada. You see, a person can be a great jurist. He can focus on salah, psalm, hajj, zakat, khums, amr bil ma'roof, nahi al munkar, tawallat, and so on. But ultimately, he'll say to you, my tears for Hussein. Yes. Ultimately, they'll say, someone said to me once, Allama Taba Taba'i, when he was writing tafsir, for the whole year, he would be busy writing the tafsir. Except one day, the 10th of Muharram, close the book. This day is Aba Abdullah's day. That's it. That there is nothing else but my focus is towards there. You'll find others like Shaheed Mutahari saying how his teacher had a problem with his eyesight and someone said to him that that clay that's underneath those who come to Majlis al Hussein placed that on the eyes and he said that he saw better than he had seen before. 
You look at the others, each one of them has a relationship with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Even when I look, I mentioned earlier, Sheikh Baqir al Irawani, I came across a beautiful poem from him, highlighting how he feels about Karbala and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He said, Karbala riddled by trial and tribulation. This is how the poem begins. Karbala riddled by trial and tribulation. We all come together to remember the grandson of the Prophet. The eve of Ashura is not one night, for it continues to live through all the years. Subhanallah. He said, the eve of Ashura, the night of Ashura, is not one night. No, no, no. I thought it's the night of Ashura. No, he said, because it lives through years. That night breaks all of our hearts, doesn't it? All of us gather. So he said, Karbala, riddled by trials and tribulations. We come to remember the grandson of the Prophet. The eve of Ashura is not one night. It lives through all of the years. That, that eve of Ashura would break the heart of all the ulama. If it broke their heart, then what did it do to the mothers who were in Karbala? Yes. Imagine you as a mother knowing this is the last night that I spend with my children. I want the mothers to feel this wherever you may be. Wherever you may be. You're a mom and the doctor says to you 12 hours left. How would you feel? I asked the dads over here. If a doctor came and told you only a few hours left, what would you feel? Tell me. Your sons, two of them, a few hours left. Or your six-month-old baby, only a few hours left. Yes. What would you feel like? I ask all of you. That eve of Ashura, you're right. You're right, Sheikh Nair. That is not just an eve. That lives through years. It takes years to recover from that night. I ask Allah one question. How did Zainab recover from that night? How? How do you recover? Because Zainab السلام, carried all the masa'ib. But still, she's a mother and she has her two boys there. Yes, the two boys are there on the plains of Karbala. And there she is. And yet I see Rabab and I see the others. Qasim's mom, Akbar's mom, Asghar's mom, all of them. All of them ready. Yes, some not so ready. Was Rabab that ready to lose her baby? That's something we'll always have to think about. But Zainab alayhi salam knew that they had all given their sons. They were ready to give theirs. She wanted now to give hers. Yes. When she wanted to give hers, she told Aun and Muhammad, go now to your uncle and tell him it's our turn to go to the battlefield. Yes. The two, the two of them, of them young, young boys, boys, young boys who were there, they went to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. They came to him and they said to him, Uncle, it's our turn to go out. He said, No, no, return back to your mother. I want you to be there for your mom. He said, But Uncle, she told us to come. And he said, No, no, go back to your mom. Make me happy if you go back to your mom. They returned back to their mom. They sat with their mom. And then they looked towards their mom. She said, but I told you to go. Why are you both back? Wallah, wallah, history will never see like this moment. Yes. How mothers put Al Muhammad ahead of themselves. That's a difficult stage to reach in life, by the way. It's a difficult stage to put the family, to put your imam ahead of you before your own family is not easy. She said, no, go towards him. He said, come back. She went towards him. She began walking towards him. She stood next to him. She said to him, why have they returned back to me? If I stop my masaib here, I think it would be enough for the night. Someone says, no, don't stop. Ayatollah Sibawe never recited one Muslim in his life. Someone came to him once, he said to him, Mawlana, just one. He said, no, let the dhakirin, let the khutaba recite masaib. I'm, I told him, I don't have that ability. Said to him, just one, please. He said, you want masaib? He said, yes. Just one musibah? He said, yes. Listen to the line that he said. This is similar, this one that I'm about to narrate. But listen to what he said. Zainab entered the court of Ibn Ziyad. He stopped. He stopped. 
The crowd couldn't stop. He said, I just want you to picture that. Zainab, Ali's daughter in the court of Ibn Ziyad. Do I need to say it? I ask you all one thing. Zainab looking at Hussein. And saying to him, please. I ask you in the name of your mom. That she knew would break him. Because his mother. His mother was everything to him. She said, I ask you in the name of your mom. Allow me to be proud in front of my mom. That I gave away like they gave away. Karbala, riddled by trial and tribulation. We remember your grandson, O Prophet of God. The eve of Ashura is not a night. It lives through years and generations, yes? You look at him, Aba Abdullah Zainab was a soft spot for him. And he couldn't say no anymore. So he came towards them. He said, are you ready to fight? Listen to their reply to him. They're like, our grandfather from one side is Imam Ali. And our grandfather from the other is Ja'far al-Tayyar. Don't worry about us. And we've been trained by Abbas. If you've been trained by Abbas, how could you be scared of the opposition? Yes? Within a few moments, the two of them were in the middle of the battlefield. At the beginning, of course, the opposition was fighting them one on one or two on two. When you fight the two of them two on two, you know these are the grandsons of Amir al Mu'mineen. Uh, you know that you are not able to get past them. The moment they strike a member of the opposition, they turn around, they look at their uncle, Abu al Fadl. Wanting to see if their uncle was proud of them. Uh, when one came to attack Aun, Muhammad would get in his way. Uh, when another would attack Muhammad, Aun would get in his way. Uh, until one of them lay a fatal blow uh, on the two sons of Zainab alayhi salam. Uh, one of them called out, Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. Imagine that scene, all of you now. Uh, Imam al Hussein came running out onto that battlefield. Uh, he removed those who were there from the opposition. Uh, one of the poets says this quite beautifully. Uh, he looked at one of them. Uh, he said to him, My dear nephew, I apologize. I could not be with you. And the nephew turned around. He said one thing to him. Uh, what is that? thing what could be on his mind tell tell my mother I died without drinking any water Allah all of you, this is your night tonight. We always say I'm in Sham tonight. All of you, those who miss Sham, this is for you. Uh, I do, died, I died thirsty. How can I drink? And my uncle doesn't have any water to drink. Imam al Hussein carried them both back to their tents. Uh, he knew this was going to be a difficult moment. Uh, he carried them back, but Zainab did not shed a single tear. Why? She didn't want the others to break down. She didn't want her brother to break down. When they took her to Kufa, she didn't break down. When they took her to Sham, she never broke down over Aun and Muhammad. When they returned to Karbala, she never broke down until she returned to Medina. Allah. When she entered their bedroom and saw the mattresses empty. Allahu Akbar. She fell on one of the mattresses and called out, Forgive me, forgive me that I never shed tears for you. I didn't want to break my brother's heart. Inna lillah wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. All of you with the tear, with the tear coming, ask for your hajat now. I give you 10 seconds. With your tear, those fathers who face difficulties, those youths who are trying to get closer to Allah, those who are facing struggles in their life, ask your dua now. Now, all of you, in these seconds, I want you to ask. Ask from the bottom of your heart. Yes, ask, ask. Our only weapon is our tears, Ya Allah. Silahul buka. That's all we have. Yes.
Ask for your hajat, all of you. Everyone here has a hajat. If not in dunya, then for your akhirah, ask now. If not for you, ask for your dad and your mom who instilled the love of Zainab into your heart. Ya Allah, raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. Protect all of our ulama, Ya Allah. Allow them to continue in the service of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. There are those of you who came to me and said that their families, some members are feeling unwell and facing difficulties. So let us all, wherever you may be here, online, whichever part of the world, all the Azadars, let's come together and dua. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا louder please أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا all of you who have sons or daughters in the name of Aun and Muhammad recite this loudly أما يجيب ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the surah al-fatiha but before it the loudest of your salawat